Thank you. So thank you everyone for attending. Um, my, I, I'm Rachel Borchard. I'm the scholarly communication librarian in the library. Uh, my position covers many things related to open access and making scholarship openly available. Um, I'm joined by my colleague, Stefan Kramer, who's the research data librarian. Um, I'll begin the presentation, then I'll switch things over to Stefan. Um, but we're going to talk a bit about uh, what is an institutional repository, um, how does it fit in with some of the larger initiatives around open access, what are some of the features of our repository reasons you should use it, and then uh, we'll talk about how to actually use the repository. Um, along the way, if you guys have questions, uh, I'll try my best to monitor chat, but feel free to unmute yourself, ask a question, raise your hand, anything works. Um, the only thing that won't work is if you raise your hand on a video, <laughs> I won't be able to see you. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. So let's start with what is open access, because if we're talking about institutional repository, we really need to start with the larger concept of open access. Um, so there's there's a number of different definitions out there, but a pretty simple one is a set of principles and a range of practices through which research outputs are distributed online free of cost or other access barriers. Um, so this is really a way to make information equitably available. Um, and it started with journal articles, which for many years um, have had a subscription fee in order to access the contents. But the idea of open access has definitely uh, applies to lots of other different types of information that would be useful or desirable to access. Um, so books and book chapters, data, um, even textbooks and other educational resources, which has its own term, OER, open education resources. Um, and one of the big principles that underlines the um, open access and allows for this to happen is uh, copyright. Um, Copyright, and we'll talk a, a bit more about licensing and copyright a bit later, but um, whenever you make a creative work of any kind, um, the person who makes it is the copyright holder. Um, and uh, in order to facilitate the open use and reuse and distribution of a creative work, um, there's something called a Creative Commons license that you can apply as the copyright holder so that others understand how they can use your work. And that's all very essential an essential part of open access is having that license so that people understand how they can use a work. So that said, uh, many of us may have heard of open access, um, but it's often a, a much more complicated set of principles and really workflows and ways of making information open than many people realize. Um, and again, open access is most closely tied with journal articles. So most of these designations that we see um, have arisen from different ways to make journal articles um, available. Um, and some of these are at the article level and some of them are at the journal level. So it gets very confusing very quickly. So uh, the good thing is that most of this is not the main focus, but it kind of leads us into how institutional repositories play a role in open access. Um, so the first four types are all um, apply to journals. Journals can have different designations of how they make information openly available. Um, starting with the top one, which is usually called diamond or platinum, um, where everything in a journal is immediately freely available and there's no charges to authors. Um, so you send your material in, they accept it, they publish it openly, usually with a Creative Commons license and there's no fees involved. Um, and that journal is supported through other financial means, usually like a, a university might support uh, a diamond or a platinum journal. And then we have gold journals. They're all also fully open. Every article that's published is immediately openly available with a Creative Commons license. However, there is a payment in order to make that um, information openly available. Um, but it's not a choice. Uh, there is no subscription fee associated with gold journals, just everything is openly available, but you have to pay a fee. And then um, there's bronze, which is some information is openly available, but it's up to the journal's decision. So some of them will make all content that's six months or older free. Um, during COVID, we saw that all of the COVID information was being opened up to facilitate scientific discovery and access, um, but it's not up to the author whether your information is open or not. And then there's hybrid, which is an increasingly uh, popular choice among journals where they still have a subscription fee, 
Um, but if you, and in order to access all of the contents, you need to have a subscription to that journal. But if you want to pay an extra charge, you can then make your article specifically openly available. Um, the confusing part is that most journals call that gold choice. So the gold and hybrid get very confusing. Anyway, the point is that there's this other option for making material openly available that does not require the journal to make decisions. Um, and it's called green, where you can take anything that you have created as a copyright holder and put a version of it up uh, somewhere. <laughs> now, once you enter into an agreement with the journal, they usually have various stipulations on where and how you can put that material up. And we'll look at that a little bit later. Um, but until you sign that agreement with the journal, it's your content. So you can put it up as you choose. Um, so an institutional repository is one of those places where you can put up green open access content. Um, the most common way that people tend to think about this, especially in the sciences, is something called a preprint. Um, so it's an earlier version of a manuscript before the final published version, um, either what you've submitted or what has been accepted, but not the final copy edited version that the journal would produce. Okay, so what is an institutional repository? Um, for us, it's a collection of openly available outputs, um, primarily scholarly outputs, but also at some educational outputs that are associated with our university. Um, we do have other repositories and Again, this is where it can get a little confusing. Um, so our institutional repository is now separate from another repository that we have. We used to have them all combined together. It was called Audra. Audra is still around, but right now it is housing our digital collections, um, like our digitized special collections or uh, digital scholarship projects um, that weren't migrated over into our new institutional repository. And our institutional repository is just one of many different repositories that are available. So I don't want you guys to leave here thinking the only way to make something openly available by uploading is to AU's repository. It's one of many options you have. Um, so government entities have their uh, some of their own repositories such as PubMed Central. We'll come back to that point a little bit later. There are subject specific repositories. Archive is one of the oldest and best known. SSRN is used heavily um, in some fields of social science. And then there are for-profit for repositories um, such as academia.edu and ResearchGate. Usually that requires some form of registration and there's more licensing around what you can and can't upload to those sites. So why would you use a repository? There's a few different reasons why, starting with the fact that you are making uh, information openly available. And when you do that, um, it tends to increase the circulation and use of what you've uploaded, um, which has a lot of different benefits. Um, there are studies that show that when, open, uh, when you make information openly available, it tends to be associated with a higher citation count. This is not universally true for all information. There's a lot of different stipulations that happen there, but generally, making your information openly available means more people can access it and use it and cite it. Um, it also contributes to a more equitable information environment. So people who don't have all of those um, access to subscriptions like we do at AU may be blocked off from your research if it is not openly available. Um, so you're making sure that anyone, you know, regardless of what their affiliation is with an institution um, or level of access that they have is able to access the material that they want or need. Um, some other reasons to use a repository, um, the material is under your control. You decide what happens to it. Uh, in the case of the AU institutional repository, you do get the AU branding and um, how we have it organized is by different groups. So departments and schools on campus or other groups of materials that belong together. For example, our theses and dissertations all have a, a separate group. So it, it increases the browsability of our content as well. Um, for our institutional repository, it does accept a wide variety of output types. Um, so not just PDFs or Word documents, but you can upload just about anything and it will accept it um, as long as the file isn't too large. And one of the, uh, rather than the benefits, but one of the you know harsher reasons to use a repository is that if you uh, are participating in sponsored research, if you have grant funding, it may be a requirement. Let's talk more about that. So there are increasingly things called open access mandates. 
as you can imagine from a funder perspective, if they are paying you money to do research, uh, it is in their interest to make sure that the results of that research are as broadly disseminated as possible. So many agencies um, and funders have uh, really gotten on board with the idea of requiring open access. Um, but the exact mandate depends on who you're being funded by. So some of the larger government entities such as NIH and NSF currently have open access mandates. Um, those mandates currently are to make your information available, I believe within six to 12 months. Um, and then Welcome Trust and Gates are two of the foundations that are leading the way in terms of open access mandates as well. Um, however, they tend to be fairly neutral about how you satisfy this requirement. So if you think back to that list of diamond, gold, hybrid, bronze, green, they don't really prefer one over the other. So they're not telling you you have to publish in an open access journal. They're not even they're not saying you have to pay the open access fee to make your uh, information available. Um, by and large, the going through a repository will satisfy an open access mandate. And it is often the easiest way and the most cost efficient way uh, to satisfy an open access mandate. However, some of them want you to upload your material into their repository. So coming back to PubMed Central, if you are funded by the NIH, it is a requirement that you upload not to any repository, but to PubMed Central within six to 12 months. However, the landscape is changing right now. It's a very interesting time <laughs> for open access. In August, 2022, the White House um, Office of Science and Technology Policy uploaded a memo. We call it the Nelson Memo because of uh, who sponsored that memo um, or created the memo and put their name on it. Um, that has mandated that any government department um, must include an open access mandate for immediate access to publications. Um, so that's starting 2026. Um, so while before NIH and NSF were two of the big ones that had open access mandates, this is not going to apply to any government agency that is funding research and the six to 12 month uh, kind of grace period to upload research will be gone by 2026. Um, so we are starting to see different agencies putting out proposals. I believe NASA and NIST right now have them open for comment um, of proposing how they would fulfill this mandate. So keep your eyes open if you are someone who is interested in government-sponsored research. This is definitely something to pay attention to and be aware of because the landscape will be changing in the next year or two. Okay, so some other uh, benefits to using repository besides the threatening you must use it <laughs> uh, is that in addition to the association with making information openly available, tending to increase citations, it also means that you're making your information available, not necessarily just to scholars, but to practitioners and other audiences who can now access and use your materials in a variety of interesting ways. Um, there is a relatively recent study that um, says that there's fairly strong evidence that um, making material openly available may increase the likelihood that it is cited in a policy document, which it, I can imagine is of interest to many people at, at AU. Um, one of the lovely things about our repository is that um, you can also track the uh, different types of engagement and use that your information receives. Um, so on the right-hand side, and I don't want to make this all about metrics, so if you do have questions about metrics, please ask me because it's a, a topic I love to talk about. Um, so on the right-hand side is a snapshot of different types of engagement of use, and this is actually an article that's not in our repository because uh, most of the materials in our repository are very new and haven't had time to accrue much attention or use, um, but this is an openly available article from an environmental studies faculty member. Um, and it was very popular, as you can see, it was uh, picked up by news outlets, blogs, it has been cited in policy twice, it's been tweeted about, um, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So lots of different engagement and use that you get to access and track. Um, and when it comes time to show what your research impact is, you have a lot of rich stories to draw on, or at least what is available, you can uh, take a look at through the, uh, the metrics that are available in our institutional repository. Um, we'll be coming back to this idea a little bit later, I believe, 
But um, one of the things that our repository does is it uh, automatically creates a DOI. That's called a digital object identifier. It's a unique number that gets assigned to scholarly works. So most journal articles have a DOI. Our repository also creates them for things that you upload. And the benefit of that is that it actually helps us track um, your material when it moves through the world. So it's tracking all of that engagement and use, which um, is driving that metrics that we see on the right-hand side. Um, objects without a DOI don't get these kinds of metrics simply because we can't find your work easily. Um, so the DOI is kind of its unique identifier so we can trace it as it moves its way through the world. Um, one of the other really interesting features about our particular repository is that you can upload material and uh, instead of making it publicly available, what you can do is uh, generate a DOI and then use that DOI as like a private DOI link. Um, and several faculty have already taken advantage of this. They'll use that DOI to include in a manuscript as it's going through the peer review process. So usually one of the last stages before an article is accepted is if there, uh, if you want to link or if the journal requires you to link to supplementary materials, such as your data, they usually want a DOI or a URL to, um, to be able to point to where that data is. So what you can do in our repository is upload the data, reserve the DOI, and then copy and paste the DOI into your manuscript, and then make it publicly available when your manuscript is publicly available. And a little bit later, Stefan is going to show you where that um, option is. So what do we accept? Um, we actually don't accept everything. And if you ever have questions, um, you can always ask uh, me and we'll also have an email for everyone who supports our institutional repository. By the way, I think I probably didn't formally <laughs> say the name of it. Um, it's AU, oh no, now I can't remember. AU Research Archives or Aura is the name of the new repository. And Stefan will be walking us through the site, uh, Aura itself. Um, <clears throat> but in terms of what you can upload yourself for faculty, staff, and graduate students, that includes most scholarly and educational materials. Um, so most of what you would want to make openly available, you can. Um, however, keep in mind, especially for staff, that our AU's intellectual property laws or policy still applies, um, that many materials that are created by staff are owned by AU, they're the copyright holder. While for faculty and students, um, the default copyright holder is the person who created the work. So just something to be aware of if you're thinking about using this. Um, for undergraduate students, in terms of our policy and not the intellectual property policy, um, we will do selected scholarly materials for undergraduate students. Um, and this is usually the showcase student research in some way. Um, so for example, uh, departmental capstones, you know, if the department decides that they want to routinely make those available. That would be a group of materials, but if one student wants to make their capstone available, uh, we'd point them to other ways to make that happen rather than our repository. Um, that said, if it is materials that the primary purpose of making that information publicly available is to uh, contribute to scholarship, right, to literature, um, that would be another acceptable reason to uh, put materials in the repository. Um, that said, there are some other limits. Um, an initial individual limit is 10 gigabytes of space. If you find yourself running low, you can uh, put in a request for more storage and we'll handle those requests on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, and then some types of materials have really advanced metadata needs. So metadata is the information about your information. So the, the author, the title, um, page numbers, things like that. I can tell you page numbers is not one of our metadata fields. Um, so if you find yourself needing some very specialized metadata, um, and a good example is geospatial data, um, there are some specific ways to tag that information to make it more findable and accessible. Um, and we don't always have those options available. Our metadata or the form that you fill out just has some very basic metadata. Um, so if you find yourself needing really specialized metadata, this may not be the best choice for you. And something like a subject specific repository might be a better bet. Um, but again, if you have questions, we will have our contact information up here. Uh, we welcome questions if any of this is ever unclear. All right, so coming back to the copyright conversation, 
Um, I actually explained most of this already, but uh, for faculty and students, they are the default copyright holders and that for most staff materials, the university holds the copyright. There are exceptions in both cases. So if you're ever not sure if you are the copyright holder, um, you can refer to the intellectual policy that's linked down at the bottom there. Um, General counsel would also, I'm sure, be happy to talk with you <laughs> in those cases. Um, however, part of the policy does say that faculty members are encouraged to disseminate their work for the public good using wherever possible open access methods and to promote American University. So obviously using our repository is a really quick, great way to both make your information openly available and to promote AU at the same time, since we do get the benefit of the AU branding when we use our repository. Um, on the right-hand side are some different options, and we could do an entire hour just talking about Creative Commons licensing. Um, but essentially, if you have the copyright, you can uh, share with other people the ways in which you do and don't want other people using, reusing, adapting, sharing your work. And that's done through a Creative Commons license. It doesn't have to be a Creative Commons license, but it is a very standardized and universal way for people to share permissions. Um, so you can see this little license features on the right-hand side actually has a very compact version of your different options. Um, so the first question, do you allow adaptations of your work to be shared? Um, that's called uh, derivatives, right? So if you upload, say, lecture notes, could someone take some of your lecture notes and adapt them for their own lesson plan? Or would they have to use your entire lecture notes as is with no adaptations allowed? So yes or no, and then yes, as long as others share alike, mean if I take those lesson plans and adapt them and create a different lesson plan, I also have to upload it and make it available with that same Creative Commons license. Um, and then the last question, do you allow commercial uses of your work? I have been involved in some very interesting conversations about what does and does not constitute commercial use. The common understanding of a commercial use would be when someone takes your Creative Commons license content and then um, charges a fee in order to buy or access that material that would be a commercial use. Um, some people have a more strict definition of it, uh, especially in Germany. <laughs> For some reason, they uh, tend to think if there is any transaction involved anywhere along the way. So for example, if you're making lesson plans openly available to students, but because students are paying to act to be in your course, that constitutes a commercial use. Um, so the question really is how much do you want to protect your content versus allowing people a wider range of possibility when it comes to how they may want to engage and use and share your work. It's really up to the author. Um, and if you ever have questions about Creative Commons licenses and what's appropriate for your content, again, um, I'm one of the, the good resources on campus to uh, consult with you on those kinds of questions. Um, one thing I should mention, our repository does require you to put a license up. It does not have to be a Creative Commons license. And one of the options is in copyright, which means I am making this material available, but I do not permiss, permit any usage unless someone contacts me for permission. And that's also okay. <laughs> Um, so we talked about all of this already, um, but down at the bottom, just to note, there are two other types of restrictions that you can add. And again, Stefan will go through this when we walk through um, Aura itself. Um, so one type of restriction is called an embargo. It's very similar to what the, uh, the journals do in the bronze model, where they make material available after six months. You can do that for your work as well. And in fact, um, if you are uploading material that is going to be published with a journal, they often ask you to upload the accepted material with an embargo. And we'll see an example of that very soon. Um, so you can specify the length of time that your material, the full text of the material is not available. And then it does become available after the embargo period has ended. That said, you can also set a permanent embargo, which means that people will have access to the metadata. They'll be able to see that the content has been uploaded. They'll see who the author is, the title is, any other information about it, but they will never be able to access the full content. Uh, and then the last option is AU only access. Um, and that means that only people who are logged into Figshare um, can access the materials. So it's, it's a pretty restrictive uh, way to access, but it's a way to make share things with our community, but not beyond it.
All right. Um, so we talked a little bit about copyright and how when you go through the process of um, submitting a manuscript to a journal, um, when you sign a contract with the journal, traditionally what you are doing is signing away your copyright rights. So the journal publisher becomes the copyright holder. That's the traditional model and it has been for many years. Um, I'm not even sure if everyone is always aware of that. But it then means that they are granting you permission to do things with your journal, your own creative content, rather than you granting them permission. Um, <clears throat> so uh, if you are publishing open access, usually you retain copyright and then you're putting a Creative Commons license on it, but you are the one who remains the decision holder. With subscription-based journals, again, they are the ones that then own the copyright and can decide what they do and don't do with your work. Um, so as you are trying to navigate this in the context of uploading materials to a repository, the good news is that there's a tool to help you. It's called Romeo Sherpa. And uh, what it does is it pulls together all of the different restrictions that a journal has placed on where and how you can upload which versions of your manuscript. So usually there's three versions. The submitted version is the one that you have written and then submitted to the journal before it has gone through peer review. This usually has the least restrictions on it. The accepted version is the version that has gone through peer review, has been usually um, revised in some way, and the journal has accepted it for publication. Um, this can often be uploaded to an institutional repository, but there are often more restrictions on how and where. And then there's the final version of record that is usually the most restricted. Um, sometimes they will let you upload it to a personal website, but usually not to a repository unless it's an open access article. Um, that said, I am just putting this little worm in everybody's ear that um, the library is trying to pursue a university-wide policy that would grant American University non-exclusive um, rights to everything that is created on our campus, which means that would give us permission automatically to upload ex all accepted manuscripts unless the publisher requests a, um, uh, what you call it? I can't remember the word, sorry. <laughs> an exception, let's call it an exception. So they would, uh, a waiver. So the, the journal would say, I'm sorry, I can't publish work unless I get a waiver for that policy. But the default is we have the rights to upload every accepted manuscript that is published um, from AU. So that is the policy that we're hoping to work on. Stay tuned, I don't know the timing. This is very, very early stages, but I just wanted to let you guys know that we are working on a, a more robust way for us to sh openly share more material and be less dependent on publisher granting us the permission to do so. Um, we talked about Creative Commons and licenses. Um, the other really good news is that Romeo Sherpa is actually integrated into our repository. So as you are going through this process, you'll probably not remember the name of Romeo Sherpa. You can always email me. I'm always happy to look up the information and guide you through what kind of information needs to go into the repository to sa satisfy journal requirements. But it is also a link within um, the Aura uploading form. So this is an example of what you would see in um, Romeo Sherpa if you looked up a journal. So in this case, what did I look up? Sorry, the Zoom. Health Policy and Technology is the name of the journal. Um, so on the left-hand side, you can see there's one, two, three, four, five, six different options for how um, you can share your materials. And you can see we've got submitted, accepted, and published. So those three versions we talked about um, earlier. On the right hand side, we have an expanded view of two different pathways for the accepted version. Um, so the top one is saying that you can upload to a non-commercial website or author's homepage. So not an institutional repository. You can upload a copy of the accepted version, but it has to have the specific Creative Commons license here. So BY just means by attribution. Anyone who uses your work has to attribute you. And C is non-commercial and D is non-derivative. So no derivatives allowed. And then you see that they also specify that you must link to the publisher version with the DOI and the published source must be acknowledged with, with the citation. Ooh. The institutional repository version is accepted version B. 
This one does have a 12 month embargo. So you would have to set that embargo, also set the license, and then again, link to the publisher version with DOI and acknowledge it with the citation, but you can upload it to our institution repository or a subject repository or another non-commercial website. Whew, that's a lot. <laughs> again, I hope if you guys uh, take very little else from this, please know there is help for all of this. It can get very confusing. My job is literally to help with uh, making information openly available in any form, and that includes interpreting Sherpa Romeo. Romeo. Okay, I have one more slide, and then I'm going to turn things over to Stefan, because um, we're now shifting it into, okay, we've sold you on the institutional repository. How do I get started? Um, so I mentioned that we do have another repository, Audra. This is where our institutional repository lived until very recently. Um, and what we just finished doing about a week and a half ago is migrating all of the institutional repository material from Audra to Aura, to our new website. So um, if you log into Aura, there's a chance that some of your materials may already be in Aura. Um, the best way to find out if there's anything that's um, in there for you is actually to just do a search in Aura. So that's that left-hand side. I search for my last name. I have the benefit of having a very unusual last name. So it's only going to come up with my content. And you can see that it, it said 10 results found. And you can see at the bottom of that very first one where it says my name, that's a hyperlink that I can click on. And then on the right side, we can see all of the items that are associated with me personally. So if you are getting um, posts and you can actually see number two is a duplicate copy that was posted under my co-author instead of me. Um, so just to get my 10 materials, I click on my name and I can see everything. I recommend that if you do have materials, it's worth a second to look over it. Um, and then if you see anything that looks uh, awry, we did our best to transfer all of the metadata as best we can, but we can't guarantee that there weren't some errors along the way. So if you see any, for example, I might want to ask that both Matt Hardings and I be added as co-authors to one version. So I delete the duplicate content. And I would just uh, email aura at american.edu to ask for that. With that, I'm going to stop my share. I'm going to turn things over to Stefan, and he's going to take it away from here. Thank you, Rachel. Uh, while I get ready to screen share, I'm going to put some related links into the chat here about things Rachel just talked about, I'm about to talk about, and then the contact information for um, our repository. So let's see. Let me. Share my screen. Do you see the slide and nothing but the slide? Great, thank you. Um, so I wanna start out by saying this repository platform is quite new to us here in the library. So we're just getting used to this ourselves. We have just migrated thousands and thousands of item of content over from Aura to Aura. And I will uh, go through the process here of submitting items to Aura primarily. Um, but before I do that, I want to start out by saying when on the screens that you're about to see, you will notice that some of the language seems rather research data centric, although Aura accommodates all sorts of content, preprints, presentations, posters, what have you. And the reason for that is the underlying platform, Figshare, which was originally created around 2011 for um, um, sharing data and associated types of content, not so much text. And in fact, in 2013, Figshare had a partnership with the Public Library of Science to integrate data hosting access and visualization with the Public Library of Science articles. So Figshare was originally a repository for non-article material, for data material. And you even saw that on the previous screen when Rachel showed her, her works in Aura, and it said, this is Rachel's public data, although it just wasn't all data sets, it was, also, it was you know, other materials. So your first step to begin the process of submitting works to um, Aura is to log in in the upper right-hand corner with your AU credentials. And at the end of the presentation, I'll explain a bit of how you, um, who already has an account in Aura automatically and who does not. Um, 
you, there are really two several or several starting points to submitting content to Aura at this point. You can start in the middle of the screen by if you already have the files ready that you want to upload, you can start that way and then add metadata later or, and that's the process I will show you now, you can fill in the metadata and then also upload the files by saying you want to create a new item in the lower left-hand corner there. And there are three ways of um, adding content. The most common way will be, I think, to add files, which means you upload them to Aura. I keep, I will just say Aura, that means the EU Research Archive, the official name. But you can also link to external files that may be somewhere else on a cloud hosted site or another repository or what have you. And then lastly, this will probably be the least often used. You can just create a metadata record about the research, about the work. It is kind of like having a library catalog record that there's no file associated with it by itself. So the file is not in the repository or not even external. That's just information about the research, if you will. So here in this example, um, I have dragged up into the um, upload files box that you saw before, four files. Um, and here are the file names. And I will say in a moment what I should be doing to explain these file names. So here what we have is one PDF file, two SPSS files, and one comma separated value file. And that should be explained, uh, and I will show where they would go in a moment to the end user, what these things are and how they relate to each other. I could also, as an alternative, have bundled all these files into one zip file, but then an end user would have to download that whole zip file. So I think that would only make sense if they really needed all the files in that one zip file. But here, some of these files are alternatives to each other. The SAV file is a SPSS format data file. The CSV file is a generic format data file. So you would probably either use one or the other. The same is the case for the code book. So that's why to me, I think it makes sense here to upload these four files individually and not bundle them all together. So everything that you see in with a red asterisk, every field that you see has to be filled in. So the, pretty clearly here, an item title is needed. Um, that will often be, if it's a preprint, for example, the same title as the published article. Um, for a data set, you would typically have the name of the study, the project, followed by the word data set. And then it's also quite common to put the, um, the time of the data collection after that. So for example, interaction of rats and mice in cages, data set 2012, that's some, something like that. So that's mandatory, not surprisingly. Um, below that, an item type is also a mandatory field. There is um, next to each item type, a little I in a circle icon that explains what that item type means or how it is interpreted in the context of Aura. So here I have uploaded a data set with associated information. So that's what I'm choosing here. The next mandatory item are authors or more broadly speaking creators. I am logged in as myself. So I appear here as an author, author automatically. If I was uploading something for somebody else, I could X out my name here. You can then add other authors by searching for them. And from what I found out, and as I said, this is pretty new to us, this platform, when you search for other people's names or email addresses, it seems to draw from registered Figshare users. So Figshare.com, any implementation of Figshare or, Fig, or the public Figshare.com, those users will appear here. If you don't find a co-author or co-creator of your work in here, you can then click on the add author details button there on the lower right and uh, add the requisite information for that person. Name, ORCID ID, email address, what have you. 
The next required item are descriptive keywords for your work. Um, these are to help people find and quickly make sense of what they have found to your works. Um, it does not draw from a controlled vocabulary, but it does draw from previously entered keywords, previously entered by other people. Then this is worth spending some time on is the description. So as the explanation here under the I says, add as much context as possible to, so that others who are not familiar with your work at all can interpret what they're getting here and reproduce it. You should describe the methodology, how the information was collected. Um, also, as in the case I showed earlier, if I'm sharing four files, I should explain here, what are they? What are these? What format are they in? What would you use them for? How do they relate to each other? Is one file an alternative to another file only in a different format? That was the case uh, in what I uploaded and so forth. So this is really kind of like an abstract for a journal article in terms of explaining the content and the nature of what's being shared here. But it should perhaps go beyond that a little bit to explain to somebody how can they utilize what you're sharing here without having to ask you Albert, every time. And then as Rachel mentioned earlier, um, another mandatory item is the license. And we have a number of Creative, Common li Creative Commons licenses. Um, the default of um, the platform is CC0. Creative Commons zero. And that means um, no copyright is reserved. It's in the public domain. So unless you want to do that, it's worth following this link that says find out more about licenses. And Rachel talked about that earlier to choose the license under which you want to make your work available to somebody else. So in this case, this would be a uh, non-commercial share alike attribution commercial uh, Creative Commons license. And then, as Rachel also mentioned earlier, there is a function for um, setting an embargo on your work, a time period before which this work, although you have uploaded, it will not become available. So you can sort of have a delayed release here. Um, and you can say, who can access this content? And as Rachel mentioned earlier, you can restrict this to American University users only with the first checkbox there, if you turn on logged in users off. And then you can also make it available within IP range at the EU community only. That means that a walk-in user to the library who uses a computer on campus could get access this content as well. So that's the embargo. And then we get to what something else that Rachel mentioned earlier, and those are the identifiers. So um, items that are uploaded and published in Aura can get a DOI automatically, but you can also reserve a DOI as in the use case that Rachel mentioned earlier. And I'll just repeat that because it has actually happened here at AU a few years ago. So a couple of faculty members were writing a book with Cambridge University Press and this publication and review process with a publisher would take half a year or maybe more but they already had, they, were, they had the data collected, of course, on, on which the research described in the book was based. And they were you know, working on making this data, putting this into a format to make that publicly accessible as well. But they already needed to include the DOI for that data set in the book manuscript because that was going to press. So they, we did that back then in Audra, and here it's automated. You can reserve a DOI for an item that you publish here, even before it's made publicly available. Very handy feature. And as Rachel said, already in popular use. Um, and a DOI, DOI is one form of PID or persistent identifier. It's probably the one most widely known and used in the scholarly community. Then as you get to the end of your submission process, you can save the changes 
it might not be a bad idea to also do that intermittently. This um, button appears on the right side of the screen as you work your way through the form. That way you could also pick up later if you don't want to fill in the form right away in one swoop, you can come back to it. But then um, after you click the first submit for review button next to save changes, you see another pop-up window that says to publish this item, it has to be submitted for review. And then it shows you who presently is involved in reviewing this content. This may change over time as we have different people working on that. Um, then it repeats, it gives you the terms under which you make your work available and it repeats under which license you have chosen to make it available. And I, in this case, I chose CC by NC SA 4.0. And then when you submit for review, finally here on the right side, then it will go into the review queue in the library and it will either appear in Aura and I hope Rachel will correct me if needed because she has done this more than I have. I haven't done it at all, in fact, so far. Uh, it will either be appearing in Aura or if there are questions about it, um, it will go back to you as the submitter with comments, questions about uh, the submitted material. Um, we particularly review um, submitted data sets for any um, identifiable information and so forth. So that may take longer. And with that, we come almost to the end here. Um, I said earlier that uh, there is a, dif a difference in who gets what, who automatically gets accounts in Aura faculty members automatically get accounts and that is by virtue of Aura being linked to Elements, which is our new faculty activity reporting system, which all faculty will have used with great delight already to submit their annual report elements. That is, so, the, so those accounts are already in um, Aura for faculty members. For non-faculty members, that is to say students, staff members, at the top of this slide is a URL where you can request an account to be created. And that will be done by the systems administrator. There's also um, a feature in Aura to collaborate for AU community members for, to collaborate with people outside of AU. And those are called projects. And here is an article that discusses what the projects are in the context of Aura and Fixture. And I think that's it. And we are ready to take questions. I will stop sharing my slides. There's something in the chat I see. Just me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I yeah. realized at no point did we actually say what the website is, where the repository lives. So it's aura.american.edu. And then I also just typed out where you can request an account if you are not a faculty member. Um, so just go there. It's it's an automatic form. It's very simple. Um, and then you can begin uploading content. Great. Thank you. Do you have any questions for us? Don't be shy. There was a lot of information there. I know, sorry. <laughs> I think maybe it might just be good to remind people that uh, aura at american.edu is our joint combined email address for anything from troubleshooting to questions, anything like that. Um, you know, you're welcome to contact us individually, but that will reach the widest audience to ensure that someone is going to respond. I have a question. I am looking for the hands, but I I couldn't find it here. Uh, for example, I submit um, a paper that uh, the paper is published in a journal. And uh, I need to put just the link, this paper, or I need to put the file inside the, the order. The file? Um, so it, it somewhat is up to you. Yes, usually what you'd be doing is making the full file available. However, okay. that's one of the times when you want to use Sherpa Romeo because at some point you'll be signing an agreement with that journal and they have different stipulations over where and when you can upload. Um, what I would recommend, I can give you the website for Sherpa Romeo, but again, it can get a little complicated. 
um, feel free to just email me uh, what that okay. journal is and you and I can walk through what your options are because often it's our repository, but sometimes it's not. Um, sometimes there are no options for uploading any version to a repository, um, in which case something like a personal website might be a better route. But okay. happy to, to, it's just so highly variable from publisher to publisher that I don't want to give you any promises <laughs> about what you should or shouldn't upload. Okay. Into Aura. Thank you. Sure. I see something in the chat. Let's see, what does it say? It says, are post postdoctoral fellows included in the people automatically included? I have one who published 18 peer reviewed articles in the last two years. Should those be in Aura? So anything that's AU uh, authored, um, no matter what their status is, um, it can go in Aura. That doesn't mean that you have to put it in Aura. Um, if it's an open publication, um, this is actually one of the differences between our old institutional repository and the new one. We used to try and grab as many open publications as possible and put them in our institutional repository. Moving forward, this is really on the individual to decide what of their content they want to upload um, into our repository. What I would say is if you have accepted manuscripts just lying around, maybe in your inbox, um, those are usually the best version to upload to a repository. They have the fewest restrictions. Um, otherwise, again, it's going to be going through Sherpa Romeo journal by journal to see which up version can I upload? When can I upload it? If it's something older, there's a greater likelihood that they're okay with you uploading it. But it really all depends on who the copyright holder is and if it is the journal, what they've decided that they will permit you to do with those articles. Um, so... Uh, if the postdoctoral fellow is no longer at AU, um, it might get a little trickier, but we could, uh, in theory, um, upload those articles. Again, I would just say email Aura or contact me directly if you want to talk more. Um, but I think it's a great idea to get as much of the content up there still here. Good. Um, it makes it a little easier. So they would just apply for an account and either work with one of us or go through Sherpa Romeo to figure out how to upload those materials. And I'll let Rachel correct me here if, if I'm misstating this, but I think if it's if it's if anybody is thinking of uploading an article that was submitted to a journal maybe years ago, I think it's worth to look at the agreement that you or the author made with that journal back then, because what you signed back then is what matters and it might be different than what um, that same journal um, what agreements it makes with authors today might be. Yeah, that's a really good point. I, I mentioned the open access conversation is changing rapidly. And that also means on the journal side of things that they're changing their policies uh, and have changed them substantially throughout the years. And I just wanted to add um, the, the, the Nelson memo that Rachel referenced earlier applies also to research data, so publications and research data. So by 2026, at the latest, all the federal agencies sponsoring research have to come up with uh, mandates to make research data and publications uh, publicly accessible. Um, so, Vera, your question was how Aura communicates with journal impact factors. Um, so our main concern is the copyright part, um, regardless of who the journal is. What I will say is that the ones that are the most prestigious tend to have the most restrictions on what you can upload elsewhere because they recognize this really valuable content. They want people to either pay the open access charge to make it openly available or to pay the subscription fee. Um, so usually we find those most prestigious journals are the ones that are not just letting their content loose because they really wanna drive people to pay to access the material. Um, that said, there's a whole lot of different factors in play. Um, we do have another database if you're interested in finding impact factors. Um, it's called Journal Citation Reports, and I can get you a link if you're interested. But we wouldn't find information about a journal's impact in Aura. Um, the metrics that we can get through Aura are about your specific article um, and how it's being shared and engaged with. Uh, it, you can find citations, I believe, as well, but there's much better places to find citation counts for an article. I hope that answers your question, but if not, please follow up. <laughs> and I'll grab that URL um, for looking up impact factors. I 
Any other questions? Okay, I think we're probably going to end a bit early, um, but just to close, remember aura at american.edu is the, the place to go if you have questions. You're so welcome, Michael. It is complicated and that's essentially why we are here. You know, if this, I always say as a librarian, if it was easy, we wouldn't have a job. <laughs> so please consult with librarians early and often anything related to information. Um, thank you all for coming and hope to hear from you guys soon. Thank you.